Well, welcome to this video where we're going to be talking about the tree data structure. Now, trees are very similar to graphs. In fact, they're actually specialised forms of graph. They are acyclical, which means there can be no circular paths between nodes. And they're undirected as well, with exactly one path between any two nodes. And we often use trees to model hierarchical relationships. Because even though we say that they are undirected, um, we imply naturally that there is some sort of um, relationship, hierarchical relationship between what we might call a parent and its child node. So in the example here, we've got A is the parent of B and C. So if there's a relationship between A to B, there has to be a relationship between B from B to A. But as you'll see later, as we traverse trees, we never really go back up. We always just go down the tree from parent to child. So it's undirected, but it's there is an implied hierarchical relationship between entities. And then binary trees are a particular form of tree where each node has at most two children. So it could have no children. It could have one child. It can have two. It can't have any other options. OK, and binary trees are particularly useful for when it comes to storing data uh, using a dynamic structure that can grow as needed, but offering very, very efficient search and access to each node, which if you think about something like a linked list, we don't have that efficient search. We sacrifice being able to use anywhere in memory, which is great, and easily adding new items to the end, no problems, but searching always involves an O of N access time. Well, binary trees, particularly binary search trees, as you're going to see, allow us to kind of solve that problem by building a dynamic structure that we can efficiently search. So trees are used for, as we've said, building efficient search and sorting algorithms. They're very useful for storing data with an inherent hierarchical structure, such as files and folders on a computer. If you go to your C drive, that's your root. Um, and then from there, you'll have um, subfolders. And inside those folders, you might have other subfolders. And we can build a um, representation of all the files on a computer system using a tree structure, um, representing dynamic data. So anything that's going to come and go within uh, some sort of data model, trees are useful because it's easy to add and delete nodes. Um, we can use them when we want to process syntax in natural languages. We can use a syntax tree. Um, Huffman trees are useful for data compression. And we can use probability and decision trees within machine learning. So trees can be used in lots of areas of computer science. Now, the tree abstract data structure, as we said, is used to represent hierarchical relationships between entities. And just as with graphs, trees are comprised of nodes that have edges. And again, as we said, um, a tree is actually a form of graph that has no directions, undirected. It has no cycles or no circular paths. It's fully connected. That means that there's no node on its own that doesn't have an edge. And there must be exactly one path between any two nodes. OK, and interestingly, we can say that a tree is a recursive data type because each child node of a given tree can be the root of a subtree. And that means we can use recursion in our algorithms, which is really um, nice, gives us really elegant traversal algorithms. So let's talk about now uh, two more specific types of trees. So a rooted tree and a binary tree. A rooted tree is a tree where one node has been designated as the root. Uh, and we can call that the start of the tree. And this node has no parent, OK? Every other um, node in the tree, well, every every node in the tree, in a rooted tree, um, can be called a parent or a child node. Um, the root has no parent, but it does have children. But every other node is either a parent or a child to another node. So in this example, A is our root node. C is a child of A, but it's also a parent of F. And as we said already, a binary tree is a rooted tree where there is at most two children. But it's perfectly valid to have no children or just one child. And again, looking at our diagram here, B has got two children, D and E. 
D and E are nodes which have no children. Uh, but remember I said that um, it's a recursive structure. So we said that like B um, is the root node of a subtree pointed to from A. Yep. Well, D and E are also technically, uh, they are also trees. They're just, D is a root node of a tree where there are no children. Make sense? Hopefully. So, uh, binary search trees are particularly useful for organizing data for efficient access, as you're going to see. And uh, when we display these things, we, we always show rooted trees with arrows along their edges. And this represents the direction of hierarchy from uh, the root to the child. But this is done to remove ambiguity as to which node is root. It's very easy to see that A is the root because we've got arrows pointing away from A, but there is no arrow pointing toward A. So A has no parent, okay? And uh, if we didn't have these arrows, you could do what we call rotation, and we could have any, any of the nodes potentially in the tree could be the root. So we use the arrows to remove ambiguity as to where the root is, but they do not imply it's a directed graph because remember a tree is an undirected graph okay despite the presence of arrows in your diagrams the tree is an undirected graph so um as with graphs and any form of graph there are various operations that we might perform um, like adding nodes and removing nodes we don't need to test for the presence of an edge between two nodes in quite the same way as a graph because we well we, we can do and we can determine that there is only one path and if there's only one path to every node then there's a good chance it's a tree um, but yes specific tree operations we might do will be to determine if a node is a root so does it have parents um, getting a list of all children which is a bit like getting a list of adjacent nodes if you think about it from a graph adding a child node removing a child node obtaining a subtree, um, which really is just obtaining a child, um, determining the height of a tree. And the height of a tree is the number of edges along the longest path from the root to the furthest away leaf. A leaf node is a child node with no, a node with no children. So you can um, talk about how high a tree is um, and uh, that's, that's quite useful when it comes to talking about balancing trees for efficient access. But that's a, that's a little bit beyond the scope of the specification. But it, it's sufficient to say that it is possible to determine the height of a tree uh, by, by working out how many edges there are between um, a root and its furthest away leaf node. So in this example here, uh, the, the, long, the, the height of the tree is two because uh, for any given child, um, the you or any any of the leaves which are d e and f each of those are two away from the root two edges away from the root so let's talk about binary search trees then now this is a particular type of binary tree so you can have a binary tree that isn't a binary search tree let that be known uh, but it's a particular type of binary tree where the insert node operation is modified in order to ensure that items are placed at an optimal location for later search and retrieval. I'm just going to get my laser pointer for this. So here's um, a, 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 an item, Dan. This is maybe the first item in our tree. It's a root node. It's got no children. So let's say we're going to insert Dan into our tree. Um, what, what we might do then, let's imagine we're going to add another item to the tree, Alice. And we need to determine where should Alice go in relation to Dan if we're going to retrieve Alice uh, later efficiently. So the, the method is pretty simple. What you do is you you go to your uh, root and you need an item. So we have two, two um, uh, arguments here to this procedure, binary search tree insert. We pass the root of the tree in. We also pass the item we want to insert. And we say if the item that we're inserting is less than the root, uh, so in this case, we're going to use an alphabetical ordering. So if Alice is less than Dan, which it is, then we check, 
is does does the root have a left child if there's no left child then we just need to set the left child to be the item we're adding which in this case is alice okay and then that's it we're done we don't we're, we're finished with um, our if and we have inserted alice successfully let's say now we want to add eddie to our search tree and we do the same thing we start at the root and we look at eddie um, if the item is less than the root well, E is not less than D, so we go else. If the root has no right child, yep, it doesn't. So we just insert Eddie as the right child of Dan. Okay, and we're finished inserting Eddie. Now, if we want to insert Bob, we've got a bit of a problem because Bob is less than Dan, so Bob really should go in place of Alice, but Alice is already filling this up. And because it's a binary search tree, we can only have two children. So are we full? Is our tree full? Well, the Dan tree is full, the tree rooted by Dan, but the Alice subtree is not full. So let's see if we can do something with that. Um, let's look at Dan. We're looking at Dan and we're saying, is Bob less than the root? Yes, it is. So let's go here. If the root has no left child, well, the root was Dan and the root does have a left child. So we can't place Bob here, but we can use our else branch. We can recursively call the, the, the algorithm again with a new root. The new root is the previous root's left child, i.e. Alice. And we're still inserting Bob. So let's start the entire algorithm again. But this time we're running it on this tree, the tree rooted by Alice. If the item we're looking for is less than the root, it's not, it's greater. Um, if the root has no right child, that's correct, Alice has no right child, we can insert Bob to the right of Alice. Okay, and now we're done. And this recursive call, signified by the purple indicator, will finish and execution returns to the previous call uh, which is signified by the green pointer, which can now also finish. So let's insert Fred. Uh, instinctively, we should be able to look at this, say Fred is bigger than Dan, so it's going to go on the right-hand side. The right-hand side is occupied by Fred, uh, Eddie. Um, Fred is bigger than Eddie, so Fred's going to appear over here as a right child of Eddie. But let's just check the algorithm stacks up. We start with the uh, root, which is Dan. If the item is less than the root, it's not. Uh, it's got to go on the right-hand side. If the root has no right child, it does. So, oh no, it didn't actually, sorry. Um, uh, no, it did, we've missed a recursive call there. I think I've actually missed a step. But anyway, um, we're doing it effectively on a new root. The new root is Eddie, and Eddie doesn't have a right-hand child, so we can insert Fred there. Uh, and let's do one more, Ben. So Ben is, let's look at Dan. Ben is less than Dan, so we go to the left. The left is occupied, so we call BST insert again on the new subtree, which is Alice. Okay, so the tree rooted by Alice, and we're going to look, we're going to be comparing Ben to Alice. Is Ben less than Alice? No. So then we say, okay, well, let's look at the right hand child of Alice, but Bob is already there, so we can't add Ben here. So we again recursively call another insertion. So we now got a third current current call going on, um, this time on the new subtree whose root is Bob. So if the item Ben is less than Bob, or BE does come before BO, so it is, we say, does the root, this root this time being Bob, have a left child? No, it doesn't. So we can insert Ben as the child as the left child of Bob. Okay, and that um, third call is now finished. Execution returns to the second call, which has now finished. And execution returns to the previous call, which has now finished. And then finally, let's add Aryan. Aryan is less than Dan. Uh, so we go to the left, we uh, Alice already occupies the position, so we do another insertion from Alice. We start again using the Alice subtree. Um, Aryan is less than the root. The root has no left child, so we can insert Aryan to the left of Alice. Finished with that call, finished with the previous call, 
process complete. So if it comes to search, so that's actually created our binary search tree. Okay, the items have been added in a specific order that is optimized for later retrieval. And we'll, we'll, this comes into its own when we come to searching. When we search for an item in a binary tree, we follow the exact same process we used when we inserted, except that instead of looking to insert a node, we check if a node matches a target. If we reach a leaf um, and we haven't found the item we're looking for, then it's not in the tree. So let's look at this example. Here's our tree again. And now we're going to search for Bob, who is down here. We know Bob's in the tree. So let's have a look at this. We're going to uh, call BST search. We put the root of the tree in and we put our target in. So when we start, our root is Dan. And we say, if the root is equal to the target, return true. Uh, well, it's, it's not. Dan is the root and Bob is what we're looking for. So let's do else. If the target is less than the root, which it is, Bob is less than Dan, if the root has a left child, which it does, then start the whole thing again on the new root, which is the left child of the old root. We're still looking for the same target, but we have to return what we get from this recursive call because we're going to be returning either true or false. So we do another call. This time we're starting with Alice and we're still looking for Bob. So we say if the root is equal to the target, it's not. Alice does not equal Bob. We say, else if the target is less than the root. Well, it's not. Bob is not less than Alice, so we jump to the else. If the root has a right child, then let's start the whole process on the new subtree rooted by that right child. So we start again. We've got a third call this time. And the root now is Bob. So if the root equals the target, it does. We return true. So this third call is going to return the value true to the second call. The second call is now going to return true to the first call. And the first call can now finish returning true, which means that Bob has been found in the tree. Let's look now for an item that's not in the tree, Felix. We start with Dan. The root does not equal the target, so Let's say, is the target less than the root? Is Felix less than Dan? No. So does the root have a right child? Yes. Let's start the whole process again then on the right child, Eddie, looking for Felix. Is the root equal to the target? No. Is the target less than the root? No. Okay, does the target have a right child? Yes. So let's start the whole thing again, this time with a new root, which is Fred. Does the root equal the target? No. If the uh, target is less than the root, Felix is less than Fred, we then say, does Fred have a left child? No, Fred doesn't have a left child, so Felix must not be in the tree, so we return false. So this third call is gonna return false to the second call, which is going to return false to the first call, which means that we can say that the item hasn't been found. Now notice, importantly, we were able to find check if Felix was the tree by checking only Dan, Eddie, and Fred. We did not have to concern ourselves with Alice, Arian, Bob, and Ben. Equally, when we were looking for Bob, we were able to do it by searching Dan, Alice, and Bob. We did not need to check through Arian, Ben, Fred, or Eddie, which means we can now search for specific items in this tree with, and be able to do that very efficiently, excluding most of the other items in the tree. So we're doing better than O of N traversal, like a, li a linear search, which is what would have to happen if this was a linked list. In fact, we're actually getting log two of N as our worst case scenario. OK, which is exactly the same as binary search. And that makes sense because we're effectively applying a binary search method. But instead of it being over in an array, which is fixed size, static data structure with all the problems that brings, we're getting the flexibility of a dynamic data structure because we can implement trees using linked lists if we want to or, or something akin to a linked list, but still retaining log2n search, which is really, really good. 
So let's talk about tree implementation. Um, AQA would like you to know that there is a way of implementing a tree using a static array uh, or, an or, or a collection of multiple one-dimensional arrays in something called an associative array. Now this is something that you would probably not be very likely to do in reality. You would probably implement a tree using tree nodes um, in a dynamic way, but we have to know this method for our exams. So to use um, this method, we're going to use three one-dimensional array. One of them is called nodes, one of them is called left, and one of them is called right. And I've seen many, many exam questions using this approach in my time, so you better learn it. Nodes stores the value of each node in the tree. Left stores indexes to the node that is to the left of the present node, if that makes sense. So Dan, the node Dan, is stored in index 0, which means left 0 is going to have a pointer to the item that is to the left of Dan. Left of Dan is 1, Alice, and as you can see, Dan points to Alice as the left child. Okay. Uh, similarly, Eddie, which is in index 2, um, has a right pointer uh, to index 3, which is Fred. And indeed, Eddie does have a Fred to the right. Okay, but uh, Eddie has none in its left um, in the array with a left pointer because there's no left child to Eddie. Now, look, this looks like a two-dimensional array, but it's not. It is this is a single-dimensional array, this is a single-dimensional array, and this is a single-dimension array. But they are arranged into something called an associative array because they're all aligned through common index numbers. So the data you find in left 0 and right 0 is related to the data you'll find in nodes 0. Okay. So this is how we can implement a binary tree using three one-dimensional arrays. We could also use a dictionary to implement this, where every node is paired with a tuple, and the tuple represents the left and right uh, connected node. So Dan is related, uh, it, you know, has uh, Alice and Eddie as its left and right child. Alice has Arian and Bob. Eddie has none and Fred. Fred has none and none. Bob has none and none. Arian have none and none because they're all leaf nodes. Okay. Great. Okay. So is there a better way? Well, I've already sort of said that there is, really. Using an associative array or a multidimensional array will result in a static implementation of a tree. And um, the limitations of that are things like every time I want to add something new, if I want to add a new node, um, I've got to allocate more space in memory. But remember, an array is a contiguous block of memory. So if this is three arrays in memory, if I'm going to add just one more node, I need to reallocate space in memory for each of those three arrays that is one uh, block, one memory uh, cell bigger, and then copy all the data from the old ones over to the new one, and then repoint my identifiers to my new arrays. It's really, really, really inefficient for adding new nodes to um, my static array. Similarly, how it would be inefficient to add new nodes to a graph that's represented as an adjacency matrix. So not ideal. So can we do a better job using a dynamic approach? Um, you know, won't but won't that introduce other problems like O of n search times that we get with linked lists? Well, it turns out actually you can do it really nicely like this. So a bit like a linked list, you have a node that stores your data. But instead of just one pointer pointing to the next item in the list, you have a left pointer and a right pointer. Uh, so Dan has a left pointer to Alice and a right pointer to Eddie. Eddie has a right pointer to Fred, uh, a left pointer to Fred even. That should be a left, that should be a right pointer. <laughs> I'm full of mistakes in this presentation. Fred has null left and right because it has no leaf nodes. Um, sorry, no children because it is a leaf node. And we can represent this using a structure like this, a struct, some sort of pointer to store some data. 
um, or, or well, in this case, it's a, it's, it's a character pointer because it's going to store a string of undetermined length, but it, it could just as easily be an integer or whatever. And it has a pointer to itself, a recursive definition here, a recursive structure, because it has a pointer to its own type on the left and to the right. And what would this look like in pseudocode? Um, well, again, here's our, our structure. Um, here's a function for actually creating a new node and allocating the memory for it. Uh, but more importantly, here's our insertion. So again, just like the pseudocode from before, we say if the item we're looking for is less than the data of the root, the root's data, then if the root has a left has no left child, then we just add a new node at, as the left child. Otherwise, we recursively call the insertion method again, adding um, the item off the left child as the new subtree that we're interested in. Um, if the item is greater than the roots data, then we do the same thing, but we check if there's a right child. If there's no right child, we add the item at the right. Otherwise, we recursively call the insertion function on the new subtree that we obtain by looking at the right child, using that as the new root, and we try and insert the item from that subtree. When it comes to searching and looking for the item, we need to know the root, we need to know the target, and we say if the roots data is equal to the target, we return true. But if the target is less than the root's data and the, the root doesn't have a left child, sorry, does have a left child, then we can recursively call the search on the left child subtree. Um, otherwise, if, otherwise, it must be bigger than the data. Therefore, we say, does the right have a child? Um, if it does have a child, we search the subtree that we get from the right child as the new root. Otherwise, we return false because the item can't be found in the tree. So we've talked about trees in their character. We've talked about binary search trees and binary search algorithms applied to the tree. We've also talked about tree implementations. The last thing we need to talk about are tree traversals. Remember, just with graph graphs, sorry, a searching isn't the same as traversing. Traversing means to visit every node in the graph, and in this case, every node in the tree. So there are three different tree traversal variants, each of which visits nodes in a different order. We've got the pre, in, and post order traversals. Pre order means we visit the current node first, then we traverse the left, and then we traverse the right. Each of this is, is a recursive um, function, I should say. An in-order traversal goes, searches through the left subtree first, as far as it can on the left, a bit like a depth, a depth first search. It goes as far as it can down the left. When it can't go any further to the left, it then visits the current node, and then it goes as far to the right as it can. A post-order traversal traverses as far as it can down the left, then as far as it can down the right, then visits the current node. Remember, visit simply means perform some sort of process on the data in that node. So looking at the pre-order traversal, uh, you can see it's a very, very elegant, almost deceptively simple algorithm due to its recursive nature. Um, to pre-order traverse a tree, you start with um, a node of the tree, which would be the root when you begin, and you visit the node. And then you say, is there a node to the left? If there is, I do the same thing on the left child. And then when that's finished and comes back here, we then say, is there somewhere to go on the right? If there is, we do the same thing on the right-hand side. Post order is basically identical, except that we, we do the visiting to the left, the visiting to the right, and then we visit the current node. And have I got an in order? Well, it won't surprise you that in order is basically exactly the same. In order, we, we go to the left, and then the, the in in between, so then we do the visit, and then we go to the right. So it's quite easy to remember, pre means that we visit first before we go left or right. Post means we visit afterwards, after we've gone left and right. In order means we go in between. We visit the left, sorry, we, we traverse left, we visit the current, we traverse right. So here's an example of a pre-order traversal on the binary search tree that we built up. 
So we're going to start by visiting the root, which is Dan. And we say, is there a root to the left, a node to the left? Yes, there is. It's Alice. So let's pre, let's uh, do the same thing, another pre-order traversal on Alice. So we visit Alice and we say, is there a node to the left? Yes, there is. So we go to that uh, tree, which is rooted with Arian. We visit Arian. Is there a node to the left? No. Is there a node to the right? No. We end that procedure and execution returns back to the traversal of the Alice tree. The Alice tree continues. Is there a node to the right? Yes, there is. We do a pre-order traversal on the right, which is Bob. So we visit Bob. We say, is there a node to the left? There is. So we do a fourth call now to the pre-order traversal uh, procedure. And we visit um, the left child of Bob, which is Ben. So we visit Ben. Is there a node to the left? No. Is there a node to the right? No. Execution returns back to the traversal of Bob. Is there a node to the right of Bob? No. Execution returns to Alice. We've we visited Alice, we've gone to the left, we've gone to the right, so we're finished. So execution now returns back to the call where we were traversing Dan. We finished traversing the left of Dan, so now we traverse to the right. And we say, is there a node to the right of Dan? Yes, there is. So we call pre-order traverse on the right node, which is Eddie. So we visit Eddie and we say, is there a node to the left? No. Is there a node to the right? Yes. So we start a third call now uh, to um, the child on the right of Eddie, which is Fred. We visit Fred. We say, is there a node to the left? No. Is there a node to the right? No. So that third call is finished. Execution returns to the second call, Eddie. That's now finished. Execution returns to Dan, which is now finished and we finish the procedure. And the order with which we visited the nodes was Dan, Alice, Arian, Bob, Ben, Eddie, Fred. And notice because it's a traversal, every single node in the tree has been visited. So now let's look at an in-order traversal. For in-order, remember I said that we go, we check, is there a node to the left? If there is, we go to the left. And we keep going as far to the left as we can. When we can't go any further to the left, we visit the current node and then we try to go as far to the right as we can. So let's see how this plays out. We start with Dan. Is there a node to the left? Yes, it's Alice. We go to Alice. Is there a node to the left? Yes, it's Arian. Is there a node to the left? No. So we visit Arian and then we explore, can we go to the right of Arian? No, we can't. So we finish execution of Arian and um, execution is returned to Alice. Right, now, we haven't actually visited Alice yet. We've only traversed left from Alice. So now we are going to visit Alice. And then we're going to look to see if there's a path on the right. And there is. So let's traverse on the right. Let's go to Bob. Now we're at Bob and we say, is there a path to the left of Bob? Yes, there is. So we'll traverse it. And we're now going to explore Ben. Is there a note to the left of Ben? No. So let's visit Ben. And now let's see if there's a path to the right of Ben. There isn't. So we finished with Ben and execution returns back to the traversal of Bob. We've traversed Bob's left side, so we can now visit Bob. Now we traverse Bob's right side, but there is nothing to traverse. So we finished with Bob. Execution returns to Alice. No, it doesn't. Uh, yes, it does. It returns to Alice, but Alice has now been fully traversed on the left visited and traversed on the right. So Alice can now finish and execution returns to Dan. Dan's left side has now been fully exhaustively traversed. So we can now visit Dan and we look to Dan's right hand side. Is there a node to the right? Yes. So we in order to traverse the right node, which is Eddie. Is there a left hand path for Eddie? No. So we can visit Eddie. Is there a right hand path for Eddie? Yes, so we traverse the right-hand path. The right-hand path is Fred. Is there a left path for, for Fred? No, so let's visit Fred. Is there a right path? No, so we've finished executing our traversal of Fred and execution returns to Eddie, which has now finished. So execution returns to Dan, which has now finished. So our procedure has finished and we've fu fully um, traversed the entire tree, but notice the order of traversal is different this time. And in fact, there's something very specific about the order of traversal here. 
Arian, Alice, Ben, Bob, Dan, Eddie and Fred. You should see that this is in alphabetical order. And that's one of the properties of a binary search tree is that if you perform an in-order traversal of a binary search tree, you will get the items printed out in order. So, quick tips for remembering the orders. Pre means we visit before the traversals. In means we visit in between traversals. And post means we visit after traversal. So rather than having to deal with all that pseudocode, um, in an exam, a really easy way to do a traversal is to use what we call the cheats method. And basically it involves putting a dot to either the left, bottom or right hand side of each node in your tree, depending on whether or not you are going to uh, be traversing in uh, pre-order, in order or post order. And um, when you then traverse the tree, you start to sort of like the left hand side of your route and you just work around in an anti-clockwise fashion. So for example, here we've got um, the dots to the left. So this would perform, if I start here and we visit the nodes in this order, every time you pass a dot, you visit it. So we're gonna visit Daniel first, then come round, we're gonna visit Charles. Then round here, we're gonna visit Belinda. And then up round here, we visit Cheryl. And then up round here and all the way around, we now visit George. Fred and we finish and that will have performed an in order sorry a pre-order traversal of the tree let's try putting some dots um, in order and let's see what happens now so this time ignore the dots to the left we're going to do the dots underneath and let's run around again so we come around here come around here now remember I'm ignoring the dots on the left this time because I'm doing the dots underneath so come around here and I've passed my first one. So Belinda is the first one I'm visiting. Then I traverse around here and oh, I've passed Charles. So let's put, get that one. Then we come around here and ignore this one. So we've now passed Cheryl and we go up here around the top and under. And now we've passed Daniel. We come around the side here past all of these nodes now we finally pass the dot so that's fred is fifth and we go up here past george which is sixth and then we have finished our traversal and so what you'll see here is that the order of traversal is belinda charles Cheryl, Daniel, Fred, George, which is again our alphabetical order. So this is definitely doing an in order traversal. This is the method to use in your exams. It is so much easier than trying to like write down the pseudocode and trace it through. When you're doing a traversal by hand, just place the dots to the left, bottom or right hand side of the node. Trace your way around and as you pass the dot, you visit it and it's that simple. So we do need to know uses for each of these traversals. Um, so when it comes to pre-order, a pre-order traversal is used to copy a tree. Okay, we have to, uh, if we're gonna visit a node, we then insert it like into a new tree um, that will create a copy of a tree. So that's um, what we use pre-order for. We also use it for evaluating mathematical expressions that use prefix notation. Um, where operators get evaluated before values. We don't come across those very often, but it's a perfectly good answer for an exam. In order traversals, we use these, as you've seen, to output the contents of a binary search tree in ascending order. A post order traversal can be used to convert a mathematical expression from infix to postfix, or otherwise known as reverse Polish notation. Um, producing a postfix expression from an expression tree. And we'll talk about expression trees uh, when we talk about reverse Polish notation later. Um, it's also useful for emptying a tree um, because if you imagine that if the visiting process is sort of deletion, then 
you want to make sure that you fully traverse to the left, fully traverse to the right before you delete anything. And then you kind of work yourself backwards. So if we were deleting a tree and freeing up memory, um, we would use a post order traversal to do that. Completing dependent processes in order. Again, if you have a um, something that has to happen after, uh, like at the end of the chain, like the last thing that could happen in a chain, you would go fully to the left, then fully to the right, and only then, when you've explored all those, then and you've got nowhere else to go, can you then get on with that process. If that makes sense. Um, and then also evaluating a recursive function with multiple calls. And we can see that coming up here. So slightly complicated slide, but let's have a look at this. This is a function Fibonacci, uh, takes in a value n, and it recursively evaluates the Fibonacci sequence number based on n being the number's place. So if we put n equals 3, it would give us the third Fibonacci number, or the third number in the Fibonacci sequence. If n is less than 2, we just return n. So if Fib 0 or Fib 1, it's going to return 0 or 1. Um, otherwise, we return uh, Fib n minus 1 plus Fib n minus 2. So if we were to put in fib5 and we wanted to work out how this is actually evaluated, fib5 is the combination of fib4 plus fib3. Fib4 is the combination of fib3 plus fib2. Fib3 is the combination of fib2 plus fib1 and so on. Fib2 is fib1 plus fib0. Now if you wanted to work out what order this is actually evaluated in, by a computer in order to derive your answer, we would perform a post-order traversal. Remember, post-order means putting our dots on the right-hand side. I'm not going to spend, well, I'm not going to actually traverse the whole thing now because it would be a bit boring for you, but you can pause it and see for yourself. But if we put the dots there, it sort of visualizes what would have to happen in order to evaluate this expression. So when we begin to evaluate Fib5, well, we're going to need to go all the way around here. And the first thing we can actually, because it's our base case, the first thing we can actually evaluate is that fib1 is 1. And then we come around here, and then we can evaluate that fib0 is 0. So we can now add those two together to get a value that fib2 can use. And it can take that value, and it can work out fib1. And those two values can come together for fib3, to be evaluated and then we can go around here boom, 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 working out fib1, fib0, fib2 which can be added to fib3 which allows fib4 to be evaluated and so on. So, it's, so this is what we mean by saying that a post-order traversal would allow us to determine the order with which a recursive um, process such which involves sort of two recursive processes being added together, such as Fibonacci sequence, it allows us to see the order with which um, these recursive functions actually get evaluated um, against their base cases. So if you want to have some fun with trees, then why don't you go away and implement a binary search tree using a dynamic structure with a set of nodes connected by left and right pointers. Um, you will need an insert method and a search method, um, and you need to test that they work. And then you should also add some um, uh, methods to perform a pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversal recursively um, that output the correct node-visited orders for your tree. And we've got a little Python starter here, um, which shows you what a binary tree node could be comprised of. It's some data it's a left pointer, it's a right pointer, um, and we're suggesting here that you can create this tree by uh, creating something called root, make that equal to btree node dave, and if we wanted to assign chris to be uh, to the left of um, dave, then what we could do is have root.left is equal to a new btree node with the data value. Chris and so on. So that should give you enough of a clue of how to get started uh, building up um, your binary search insertion and search methods um, and also hopefully being able to complete some uh, traversals of your tree from the root as well.